Thank you, Ms. Arti Kanti. It was great to hear you. Uh, now, I would like to welcome Mr. Leon Scaliotis on the stage. He is the Sales and Marketing Director of Flavortech Private Limited. He has joined us from Australian-based technology company in 2005. Leon gains great pleasure in assisting coffee, tea and flavor companies worldwide to grow their business and improve their products in regards to the production of natural aromas, extracts and concentrates. He is going to speak on continuous tea and coffee extraction systems. So, here I invite Mr. Leon. Please, sir. Thank you very much and thank you for being here for my presentation um, and I'll have my presentation very shortly, second one, thank you. Very shortly, I'm sure, there we go, okay. Oh. And let's open it up. Um, so as was mentioned in the introduction, I'm the Sales and Marketing Director for Flavortech. Um, and in this presentation today, I'm going to be talking about the continuous extraction systems that we have developed and have been using for the last uh, 30 to 40 years um, with customers all around the world to produce not only instant coffee but also instant tea and ready to drink tea and coffee products. So on the journey today of the, of the next 35 to 40 minutes that I'll be speaking, uh, we're going to go through a little bit of an introduction of who Flavortech is, uh, where we started, how we started, what we do, what industries that we uh, manufacture for, and then we're going to look at traditional or conventional coffee and tea processes and the alternative, which is the integrated extraction system that we actually manufacture um, and developed and, and install at coffee and tea companies around the world. So first of all, um, you all know Australia, I hope, right? Mm -hmm. Kangaroos, maybe? Yes, okay, good. Um, well, where that letter A is, is where the town of Griffith is, and, and we're based in that town. We started there because initially our technology was for the wine industry. And that particular area is one of, you know, although you can see it, it's only on the edge of Australia, or what's considered the edge of Australia, Australia is still 5,000 kilometers wide and 5,000 kilometers from north to south. And we're really on the edge of the desert. So we're an irrigated town. We get our water from a river uh, 50 kilometers away. And uh, it was developed about 100 years ago. So without that water from that river, that, you know, it would be desert in that area. But it has become a food bowl for Australia. Um, what we manufacture there is what we term thin film technology. So instead of filling a pot you know, to brew something, we actually produce a thin liquid layer of about one millimeter film thickness that goes through our system. And, and the reason we do that is that when you're using such a thin film, you don't need to apply as much temperature or have as much of a residence time, you know, brewing time, to actually produce a product. And we equate that with making a higher quality product. You know, often when you use high temperatures, you damage the product, you damage the active ingredients like the polyphenols, the aroma. And by using such a thin film, we actually manage to protect that. So, as I mentioned, it's a, it's a bit of a food bowl. Those lines you see on the fields, they're not actually roads. They're actually water canals taking water to all the, um, all, all the farms. But in, but in the area of Griffith, we produce about 40% of Australia's grapes. If you've ever heard of Yellowtail Wine, that's actually produced there. Now, this is a company that produces 60 containers of wine per day and ships them. So it's a, an, a huge amount of wine. Um, the area crushes about 260,000 tonnes of grapes per year. So it is Australia's largest grape producing area. Um, it is also one of Australia's largest citrus producing areas. Um, we do one and a half million tonnes of rice. We have four cotton factories. Ferrero Rocher, the, the um, chocolate company, planted a, a million hazelnut trees a few years ago just to have another source of hazelnuts in the future. And of course, there's lots of other, other products that are produced there. 
So Flavortech produces these thin film spinning cone technologies that I mentioned, and, and it's really about producing a quality product. So there are other ways of doing it, cheaper ways of doing it, but quite often you do damage the product. By using these short residence times and low temperatures, we manage to produce a much higher quality product and give options to our customers to differentiate their product from conventional products that are on the market. I mentioned there our goal is to improve your business. That's our customer's business. You know, what we say is pretty much validated because 30% to 40% of our business every year is existing customers that are coming back because they're growing. You know, and, and they're growing because instead of being able to go with one product and to their customer and say, this is our tea product, they can make 10 or 20 different aroma profiles, different aroma tea products from the same source material and say, which one do you like? And that get, helps them get that business. Um, we, we think and act globally, and, and really, you know, that's demonstrated by where we are in the world. Um, we do have an office here in India, and we do have a, a business development manager, and we also have service guys here in India. Um, we have a pilot plant, so a pilot plant is used to demonstrate our equipment. So customers from all around the world send their coffee or tea to us, and they come and visit, and we show them how the equipment works and show them the different products that are, are produced. And we have one of those in Australia. We have one at the University of Reading in England, and we've been there at the School of Food Bioscience for um, over 25 years now. Uh, we even have one in America, uh, because the Americans don't know that there's other parts of the world, you know, and they like to have everything on site and visible. Um, so we have a pilot plant there, which we put in lately. But we have agents and distributors all around the world, and 90% and of what we manufacture is exported. And actually this week, we won the national manufacturing category from the Export Council of Australia uh, that was held at, in Canberra, which was a, a great event for us, um, because we were up against some large companies like Robert Bosch and, uh, and some defense companies, and, uh, and Flavortech actually won the manufacturing award. So we're all pretty proud of that, and that's just happened this week. So the industries we're in, coffee and tea, that's why we're here today, right? Um, that's about 60% of our business. And what we do for coffee and tea, we can capture aroma from coffee and tea for various instant coffee companies or even flavor companies. Uh, we can produce ready-to-drink teas. So if you go to America, probably six or seven of the top ten selling brands are actually manufactured on our technologies. So when you go to uh, McDonald's or when you go to uh, KFC or whatever, and you have the post mix there, you know, you can get your Coke, you can get your Fanta, you can get your tea. You know, you can fill up your, your jar and, or your glass and go back to your table, have your burger and an iced tea um, done in bulk. Um, we also have, um, we also changed uh, tea facilities going from a conventional method to a continuous processing. And the benefit of that is that, of course, we capture the tea aroma right at the start before it is lost. So the instant tea that's manufactured is much higher quality, full of aroma, but also has more phytonutrients in there, more polyphenols, which is what tea is all about. In the dairy industry, um, probably one of our biggest customers is a, a New Zealand company called Fonterra, and they use our spinning cone column, which is an aroma uh, technology, to remove grass flavor from milk. So they use, the, they, re they use the system to remove the grass flavor to standardize the milk for cream production for their export market. Um, alcoholic beverages, uh, we do, well, it depends which side of the fence you're on, we do something terrible for alcoholic beverages, we remove alcohol. So, so uh, people go, well, why would you drink it? But, you know, it's a growing market around the world, especially in Europe, for zero alcohol beer and zero alcohol wine. Um, and that's really where we started 40 years ago. Um, but the world has caught up and it's, it's a growing market for us. So we've sold um, systems into places like Russia, South Africa, China, um, Spain, Portugal, France, to, to make zero alcohol wines and beers. Australia and America, of course, um, in the pharmaceutical industry, our evaporator, we have an evaporation system that I'll talk about shortly, but it only has one second heat contact time on the product to concentrate the product. So all those active ingredients are, are retained. So large pharmaceutical companies are using that technology. And the last two, of course, are flavors and fruit and vegetables. And, and I tend to link them together because flavors are the flavor companies. 
You know, it's where you go to buy your apple flavors, your citrus flavors, your, your different fragrances. Most, most of the flavor houses around the world are, are using our technology. And fruit and vegetables are primary producers, you know, the, the, the growers or the juice makers that want to add value to their product or to capture the flavors from their waste streams to sell to the flavor houses. So that, that's a fairly large market. So for the last 30 years, um, over 30 years, we've been dealing with the coffee and tea industry. And now we have over 90 SECs, or spinning cone columns, for aroma recovery in the coffee industry, and over 45 in the tea industry. And I have to say that in the tea industry, the bulk of them would be used to make the iced teas, like the Nest tea, um, like the Lipton iced tea, and you know Arizona, those sort of products. So, just to give you some trends, I travel a lot around the world, so um, I get to see a lot of things. One of the, uh, the big items at the moment in America is bag in box, um, where they make tea or coffee, um, mix it with sugar, mix it with water, uh, with other flavors sometimes. And this is what goes into that post mix that you get at those fast food chains. So you can get your Coke, your water, your iced tea. So it's actually made, packaged in a box, and actually sold in these 20 liter boxes. And it goes to retail chains, it goes to restaurants, airports, etc. cetera. It's a, it's a growing market in, in America because people are moving away from pop or fizzy drinks. And, uh, and tea is seen as one of the ways of you know, having something healthy. Of course, if you get the Sweden tea, it's, it's got probably just as much sugar as, as has the Coke, but they do sell unsweetened tea at, at these places as well. Um, canned coffee is growing. So the ready to drink market is, is sort of growing throughout the world. Canned coffee is probably growing, has category growth of about five to five and a half percent per annum. Okay. So companies like Suntory in Japan, um, which is one of our largest customers, they're producing the boss range of coffee. And I mean, 20% uh, of the coffee that is drunk in Japan is actually in the canned form, you know, and Japan is the fourth largest importer of coffee in the world, you know. Um, iced teas are also building. Category growth for iced tea around the world is 15%. You know, it's, it's, it's a huge growth market. So I quite often see tea estates and they're saying, oh, you know, we're getting a very good price for our tea, we're getting $5. Well, tea aroma or, or tea concentrate in the States is selling for about $25 per kilo, $30 per kilo to make these finished products. Vending machines are getting more popular, so you start seeing them everywhere. I mean, in Japan, there's something like 5 million vending machines throughout the country selling everything from magazines, drinks, um, you know, you think about it, you know, fruit, food, they, they sell everything in Japan through vending machines. Cold brew, um, cold brew coffee is huge in America, um, has, has made some dents in, in Asia and in, um, in Europe. Um, it's continuing to grow. Um, and the latest trend is cold brew tea that's coming out as a healthier tea option that is s brewed over you know, anywhere between 14 to 20 hours where you just let it steep at room temperature and sort of let out all the soluble solids and all the goodness. Um, of course, you know, some large corporations think that people don't know how to you know, grab some tea or some coffee and put it in cold water, so they sell packs for cold brew. Um, and of course charge a lot extra for the packaging, but it's, you know, it's just ground coffee that you put in the beaker. You know, it's, it's, it's no, there's no magic to it, but they seem to be making money from it. Um, something new, you know, everybody's used to tea bags. Well, there's people out there now making coffee bags. Um, I carry some of these uh, with me when I travel because, you know, you have a, an espresso or a Brazilian and it's actually in a, in a tea bag. Can I call it a tea bag when there's coffee in there? But um, uh, it's a coffee bag and, and you just need hot water and then you dispose of the, of the coffee bag, but you get a, a good standard flavor. Um, of course, people around the world are getting more educated on coffee. They're starting to understand that coffee is not just coffee. There's coffee, single origin coffee from you know, Brazil, from Colombia, from Guatemala, it all has different flavors, just like tea. I mean, you can say black tea, but if you have black tea from Salon or Assam or Darjeeling, it'll taste different. Of course, in conventional methods, you're losing a lot of that varietal 
nice flavors of those locations unless you're capturing the aroma. And that's what we're allowing people to do with our technology. Three in one is an easy way. So you can have your tea powder or your coffee powder mixed with sugar and creamer already in this little sachet that you just rip open and add to hot water. That's very big in Asia. Um, not so popular in other parts of the world. Um, pods, coffee pods. Um, I've actually seen tea pods in America as well. So people are putting them in tea and putting them through a Keurig machine or through a Nest, uh, Nestle pod machine as well, just to, to get a brewed uh, coffee or a brewed tea. And of course, as people want more coffee and more tea, more cafes and more tea shops are opening up um, for people to go there and, and you've seen Starbucks come into the country in the last 12 months, I think, with, with Tata, is that correct? Yep. Um, but, you know, coffee chains like Starbucks are opening up, but there's also the single smaller franchises opening up around the world. By the way, can anybody tell me how many Starbucks are in Australia? No? No, I'd, I'd give a really good prize. I'd also be surprised if anybody knew. There's only six Starbucks in Australia. Um, there's no, is there anybody from Starbucks here, by the way? Oh, good. Um, we don't consider Starbucks as, as, as good quality coffee, you know, in, in Australia. So, um, you know, we sort of grew up from the Italian background and Italian espresso, um, and we really know the single origin stuff. So Starbucks is a is very bland coffee for us. But, you know, if you can't get coffee anywhere, Starbucks is, is a good choice. Um, instant coffee. Instant coffee is growing at about three and a half, three to three and a half percent per year. Um, it is starting to improve. Um, our systems are helping achieve that. Um, but there's some very old factories out there still churning out the same old coffee. Um, but even then, we, we can sort of help. Um, the future, well, nobody knows, but there's always something new coming on. And, and now, you know, baristas are, are well respected. Before, they were just somebody that worked in the coffee shop. Now they walk around, you know, with an apron, and, and they're very proud to be called a barista. Um, but you don't know what the future will bring for, for coffee and tea. So let's talk a little bit about the technologies that we have for coffee and tea. The first one is the spinning cone column. Now the spinning cone column looks a, a little bit like a rocket, but it's actually a distillation column. And what that means is that it actually um, can boil under vacuum, so it can use lower temperatures to, to achieve that boiling, that boiling point. More correctly, this is a steam stripping column. So we actually use, we have product coming from the top and steam coming from the bottom. And as the, the two phases mix, that steam is not only brewing the tea or the coffee, but it's also capturing the volatile aromas, you know, the, the, the very light var varietal notes of the tea or the or single origin notes of the coffee and taking them out and separating them as, um, uh, as a clear liquid, which can be used later on. Now, to give you an idea of what it looks like inside, we, we have a a central shaft, I'll point, I don't have a pointer, but we have a central shaft on the left and attached to that shaft we have these upside down cones that are spinning. Um, attached to the wall we have these stationary cones. So what happens is the product in red falls onto the first stationary cone and by gravity runs down forming this thin one millimeter film. It then falls onto the spinning cone and the centrifugal force creates another one millimeter thin film, which sends it up the cone, hits a wall, falls on the next stationary cone, and vice versa. So it has this path where it's going up and down through the column, going from cone to cone. The steam in blue is coming from the bottom, and as you can see, as it travels up through the column, is picking up the volatile aroma, but also brewing the tea or brewing the coffee in that process. And, you know, conventional tea batch process might be anywhere from five minutes to I've seen 35 minutes for brewing of tea um, to remove the soluble solids. The residence time in our system is only 25 seconds. Okay, So things like uh, polyphenols are protected, well, because you're running lower temperatures, but you're also much shorter residence time, and we're capturing the aroma. 
The other thing that I should point out is that most distillation columns can only process a clear liquid. We can actually process a slurry. So this is some green tea, you know, 10% weight by weight, so 10, 10 kilos of tea, 90 kilos of water. And this is how it's been discharged from the spinning cone column. So, you know, we've captured the aroma, and this slurry, which has now had the aroma removed, is then put through a decanter or clarification system to separate the solid particles from the extracts. And that extract has more soluble solids than you know, boiling it for half an hour, because this is such an effective system. And that extract could then be made into the ready-to-drink products, or can be concentrated and then spray dried to make your powder products. And just before you make that powder, you would add back the aroma that you've captured through the system to make sure that it has high impact. The key benefits are that it's a uh, it can process those slurries or purees. I mean, when I say purees, think mango pulp or banana pulp can be processed, is processed through this system to capture the natural aroma. Um, we say the fragile volatile compounds are recovered intact. And what we mean by that is that you can actually tell that it's a Darjeeling or an Assam or whatever because we've captured those light notes that are typical of that particular tea. The product that is being processed, you know, the extract, has minimal damage. So we have a lot of customers that are stripping the aroma from juices and then still using that juice. It's just missing the aroma and they concentrate it because most concentrators would lose the aroma anyway and they would damage it. So we capture it first. The spinning cone column has some operating parameters that we can change. So instead of just capturing one aroma, you can decide how many of the light aroma notes that you want compared to the medium notes to the heavy notes. So you can make a lot of different combinations. So if you're a producer of tea aroma, you can go to your customer and instead of going to your customer with one tea product and saying, do you like it, yes or no, you can go with 10 or 20 or 30 different products that you've made from the same tea and say, which one do you like? And if they say, I like number five and number six, you can fine tune the system to actually produce something in between that actually matches what they want. And this is how our customers differentiate their products by being able to capture exactly what their customers want to produce new products. The uh, spinning cone column allows you to brew the tea as well as capture the natural aroma. Um, you can remove unwanted flavors. So just like the dairy company in New Zealand, who has 25 of these systems, by the way, is removing grass flavor from milk and retaining the other milk flavors, we do have customers that might have fermented apples and can pull out the nice flavors or, or remove the undesirable flavors from products that have been spoiled. Um, the system, turn left at the next corner. Is that, was that directions that I heard? No, it's okay. Um, the system is cleaned in place and it's, more importantly, it's continuous. So it's not a batch process where you just, you know, you have to empty the tank fill it up, empty the tank. This one, you just keep feeding the tea, the water keeps get, getting mixed, and can work 24 hours a day. Uh, another technology that we manufacture is the Centrotherm Evaporator, and this is quite unique in terms of evaporation technologies. Most evaporators take minutes, they use much higher temperatures. This has only one second heat contact time on the product. So to give you an example of how unique this is, this is used by most pharmaceutical companies for vitamins, for enzymes, for um, proteins, um, active ingredients of any type, because those products are protected. You know, one second heat contact time hardly, hardly damages it. So it can produce a much better tea concentrate, a much better coffee concentrate, keeping those polyphenols intact. We don't sell it as a commodity item, we tend to sell it for heat sensitive products or where customers want to make a much better product. And you can see here, as a final evaporation stage. Sometimes if customers already have a falling film evaporator, instead of trying to go to a higher concentration and damaging it in the, the falling film evaporator, we tell them to go to a certain point, and then we put our centrotherm evaporator to do the final concentration step, which is really where the, the, the product would get damaged. And that way, in one second, they can go to 60 bricks for tea, um, or even 70% you know, solids for coffee. So that's coffee at 70% solids. Um, normal evaporators can't go to that, to that level. They, they would burn the product and they would actually probably seize up. So 
25 years ago, we had a large beverage company approach us and say, look at our facility. We have tanks boiling here. We have uh, you know, the evaporator over there. We have cleaning systems here. We have forklifts running around. Help us automate, help us make this a more streamlined system. They had had a, a forklift accident where somebody was actually um, fatally wounded. Well, fatally means you know, they died. So they were looking at ways of, of streamlining the process. And we developed this integrated extraction system which took away all the people, took away all the forklifts, and made a continuous process for their ready-to-drink beverages. It's bro basically broken down into four parts. The first part is where the tea leaves or the coffee beans go into the hopper. They fall into a mill, so we actually cut the, cut the tea leaf or, or, or the beans into about one millimeter size to get a uniform size of the tea. Um, now, if you cut something, you normally smell it, which is pretty bad because it means you're losing the aroma into the, the atmosphere. So we developed a, a wet milling technique, so we actually cut underwater. So any aroma is actually trapped in that water mixture where we're making the slurry that is going into the slurry tank. And from there, that slurry mixture goes into stage two, which is our spinning cone column. So it's capturing the aroma. You can control which aroma you want to capture, but it's also, in 25 seconds, brewing the tea or the coffee. From there, depending on the clarification requirements, we might have a decanter or a centrifuge or even a membrane system, depending if you want a very bright tea product. And then from there, that extract is being concentrated in our centrotherm evaporator. Now, this system here that you see can, pre can process 500 kilograms of tea per hour, which is 5,000 kilograms of slurry per hour. So it can produce about 4,000 litres of tea at around, a tea extract at about three and a half bricks. Okay? Now, drinking strength in those tea bottles that you normally get is about 0.3. So if you're producing uh, 4,000 litres per hour approximately at 3.5, multiply it by 10, that's 40,000 litres um, per hour you know, of ready-to-drink product. Plus you're also capturing the aroma that you can add back to that product um, to really give it a lift. And what we find is that once the aroma goes back in, people generally can reduce how much tea they're putting in their bottles because that aroma has a real impact when you unscrew the cap or open the can. So Boss, as I mentioned, uh, or Suntory, are, are using the system for all, most of their canned coffee. Um, a few years ago, we had a Chinese company called Nongfu Springs come and do a trial in our facility. Um, they wanted a system within three months. We told them it wasn't possible, so they said, you know, we want to buy your pilot plant. Uh, we said, really? Uh, and they said, yes, because the harvest season is coming and we want to do some trials on our tea before we commit to larger systems. So we said, okay, we'll sell it to you. And they said, air freight it. So we air freighted a small line to them in, in China, installed it for them. And true to their word, four months later, they bought two large systems. Within two years, they came back and bought another two large systems um, because they started making this product, which is different types of tea, um, but, they have, but they're proving very popular in China, and it's because of the aroma and uh, the content of the, of the products. The same line can be used for tea and coffee, as I mentioned, but it can also be used to make cold brews. So we have a customer here in Taiwan that's uh, on, on that side making a cold brew coffee product, and he's using Guatemalan coffee beans. Now, Guatemalan coffee beans are very fruity, very light, so you can actually taste it in the cold brew coffee that, that you're drinking. To give you an idea of size, you saw the larger system before. This is a, our small system. Um, you know, and it starts off with the spinning cone column and slurry preparation there. We have a decanter, we have a centrifuge. In this particular application, there's a, a membrane, oh sorry, I'm starting here. Spinning cone column, decanter, centrifuge, filtration system, and then the evaporator, all the tanks. And basically, that can fit on about the same footprint as a, as a bus. Now, we don't build them on the bus, don't get confused, but it's about the same size as a, as a bus. So, you know, in, in, a, in a room this size, you could actually have two of them, 
right? Um, and something like this would process perhaps uh, 70 kilograms of tea, tea leaves per hour, um, or 130 kilograms of coffee per hour to produce ready-to-drink beverages. Um, and if you were going to make powder, then you'd need a spray dryer or a freeze dryer. So if we have a look at the conventional ready-to-drink tea process, what normally happens is that tea comes in, it goes through, well, oh, sorry, it's ready-to-drink coffee, it goes through a roaster, it gets ground, it gets boiled, you separate the coffee beans from the extract, it gets clarified, and then if you have the bottling line, you can actually add water, add your sugar, and bottle it straight away, or you can concentrate it to go through there. And you can see that normal extraction systems would lose a lot of the flavor in the clarification step. They would lose a lot of the flavor in the evaporation step and also in the extraction step. It's also very slow, um, takes a lot longer. Um, and as, as mentioned, you know, it can produce burnt or stewed flavor notes, uh, which come through in, in the final product. Our approach um, is using the integrated extraction system. So the coffee would come in, it would get roasted, we would mill it to one millimeter in size, and that one millimeter in size helps the extraction happen much faster. So in 25 seconds, we would extract it in the spinning cone column and recover the flavor. We would clarify it, and just before it goes into the can, you would add the flavor in the blending step. Or if you're gonna be concentrating, then you would add the flavor after when you're ready to actually bottle it. So the key benefits of that is it's continuous. You only need one person to run the whole line. Um, you do capture the aroma. You can capture different parts of the aroma to make different products. And uh, you can adjust the operating parameters or even the, the concentrate levels that you want to achieve depending on your customer requirements. For the instant coffee process, so that was ready to drink. For the instant coffee process or instant tea process, they normally roast, they grind, and then they have these percolator cells, and if I had a pointer, up in the top corner, where each percolator cell boils to 180 degrees, and the residence time in each of them for the coffee is about, can be anywhere from 15 minutes to 40 minutes. So the process just for the extraction of the coffee for instant coffee can, can take anywhere between two to four hours, okay? So it's a long process that the coffee's going under. It then goes through the evaporator before getting to a dryer um, to be made into a powder. And, you know, our customers have told us that at each of those steps, the instant coffee process, the conventional instant coffee process, can lose flavor unless you're capturing it somewhere. Now, in the past, we have been selling the spinning cone column to capture the aroma after the extraction step. The reason for that is that in the conventional process, they don't really grind the bean, they just break the bean, so the large particles don't allow it to be processed easily through the spinning cone column. But we've sold over, I would say, 70 systems in instant coffee factories all around the world to capture the aroma at that particular step, protect it from the evaporator, which would damage the aroma, remove the undesirable burnt coffee aromas that are made in the extraction system, and then add it just before it's made into a powder. So possibly, you know, we have customers here in India that are using this particular process um, and where they have the SEC after the extraction system. And they've got products on the market, of course, and they've been putting products out in the market for a long time. So instant coffee factories have been doing this for the last 35 years with our spinning cone column. Our approach, of course, with our integrated extraction system comes from customers continually asking us, well, you know, we don't want the aroma from an extract, we want the aroma from the roasted coffee beans because we want to add the coffee flavor that's capped just like from the espresso machine. You know, we want that fresh espresso flavor. In our dealings with flavor companies, we've worked out that the best way to capture the natural flavor is to actually process the beans themselves through our spinning cone column. So, and, and that's what we do. We grind them up, capture them, but it has to be done before extraction. So what we did is we developed a new technology called the rotating disc column. 
Now the rotating disc column is a, a pressure vessel and it's really a reaction column where we can control exactly the time, the temperature and the pressure that is used for the extraction of that coffee. So as I mentioned before, conventional coffee processes take anywhere from two hours to four, five hours to do the extraction. We actually do it in 20 minutes. And we do it after we've captured the aroma first. So the aroma, the natural aroma is captured and then we do the extraction. And we do it in 20 minutes so the, the coffee is a, a much higher quality. The inside of it is very similar to the spinning cone column in that you have that central shaft, but instead of the cones, we have these paddle discs. So we have rotating paddles and we have stationary paddles. So as the product is going through, it's actually getting agitated. And that's the major difference between our system and the conventional systems. The conventional systems, you basically fill the vessel up with, with coffee, add water, and then just apply, uh, apply a lot of heat. Um, and a lot of pressure. There's no mixing and it takes a long time. Because we're mixing, uh, we can actually shorten that time to 20 minutes. So the process is we make the slurry, we put it through the spinning cone column to capture the flavour. From there, we put it through a decanter. That extract one can be used for ready to drink coffee products, okay, if you wanted to. The solids or the coffee grounds that have been separated can then be re-agitated with water and they can go through our rotating disc column extraction system at 180 degrees and then when they come out after 20 minutes they go through a decanter to produce extract 2. Now that extract 2 is that high yield coffee when added with extract 1 and clarified can then make a very nice coffee product and if you want to smell an instant coffee product that's been made through our process, you can come to our stand upstairs. I think we're S19? S21, thank you very much from, from the back of the crowd. Do I have any other offers? No, um, S21 is, is, the right, um, is the right booth to come to, but we have some instant coffee that we produce through this for one of our customers. Uh, we have sold one of these systems into India and it's being installed uh, over the next couple of months and, and there's also a Colombian company that's starting it. So it's very new technology to actually be used in the instant coffee industry um, in this type of process. But the whole process can be run by one person, which is, is the nice thing. But if you come and smell the instant coffee, you'll, you'll say, well, we've had people smell it and say it smells like an espresso that's come out from a, a pressure machine. Uh, we also have some tea aroma up there that's been captured, some salon tea aroma. We also have some coffee aroma. So you can come and come by the stand and just have a smell and see what we're talking about. Um, one of the large systems we've designed, uh, you can see here, the conventional processes can be three or four floors high. You know, the, um, can be very large, um, require many people. This is all on one floor with a ceiling height of about 8 metres. And we need about 38 metres, well, 6 metres of height, 12 metres width. But you basically have the slurry preparation, the spinning cone column, the rotating disc column, the decanters, the uh, a membrane system, and then the evaporator, all in this space, all connected. So if something happens at this end, it talks back to the other systems and says, hey, stop sending me product because I have a, an issue until it's checked. Everything just runs on water. So we have customers with our IESs where they go to lunch and leave the system because they know when they come back, if there's been a problem, you know, the factory's not flooded with coffee or tea. Everything's sort of protected. So the process allows the flavor to be protected you can make many different products, so you can actually make single origin instant coffees or single origin teas where, that, where you can actually smell where that tea's from or smell where that coffee's from and taste it. Um, in this coffee process, it only takes 20 minutes in that rotating disc column rather than hours. It's, it's continuous and you can actually control it very easily. So going from one tea product or one coffee product is just a matter of two minutes. You just have a break because it's a continuous system. You don't have to empty the tanks. You just have to do a, a small water rinse and start the next product. And you just divert the valves to a new tank. So very, very quick. 
The other thing we've been working on is, of course, a better drying system. And this, is, this applies for both tea and coffee. Um, typically, coffee and tea has been spray dried, which uses you know, temperatures of over 200 degrees to make that powder. And quite often, you know, it destroys it. It's also very energy hungry. Uh, we've been working with a company called Clextrol, which is a French company that makes extruders uh, for the food industry. Um, and we've been working on a new drying system, which not only saves up to 40% of energy, but also retains the flavor better within the final powder. Key to this is the fact that they use our evaporator to go to a very high concentration to feed their extruder. Now, we, the extruder, as you can see, has a long barrel, and that barrel is made up of eight segments. At each segment, you can add different products so in one seg and have it at different temperatures. So in one segment, at maybe 10 degrees, you can add the aroma. At another segment, maybe at 40 degrees, you can add sugar, um, you can add creamer. And the coffee or tea gets blended with these things to make one particle. So if you remember at the start of the, the, uh, the presentation, I talked about you know, three in one. So you could actually make it just a one in one, but you know, still with the creamer and the sugar, but all in the one particle, blended well together. And you could then make it into a jar. The reason people make those three in one sachets is that the density of sugar and tea or coffee and uh, creamer is all different. So if you tried to put it in a jar, everything would settle out depending on the different densities. So they keep it in the sticks, so when you pour it out, it's all perfectly mixed. With this EPT system, those three compounds would all be blended into one particle. So you could actually fill up a jar of three in one where the cream and the sugar and, and the tea are all mixed together. So you concentrate, you go through the extruder to, to make that formation, and then it goes through a gas injection. So CO2 is added to make a foam, and it is that foam that goes into the drying chamber. Now, typically, spray dryers use temperatures of maybe 200 degrees as an inlet and maybe 100 degrees as an outlet down the bottom. This particular system uses an inlet temperature of about 150 degrees and an outlet temperature of about 50 to 60 degrees. So the temperature is much reduced. Because you're also feeding it at very high concentrations, it means less water needs to be removed. Typically, a spray dryer would use three kilos of energy to remove one kilo of water. This has about 40% less energy usage than the typical spray dryer. So we're excited that it saves energy, but we're more excited that it also produces a very different product. If you have a look at spray dried powder, it's all different, and this is under an electron microscope, so you, you can't normally see this with the eye, but it's all different sizes. Some of the particles are broken, and they're called fines. It's a, it's a, a waste product. Um, and you know, it's all different, different sizes. And you know, I had a customer in Japan uh, describe, it, describe it as an empty eggshell. So it's basically just you know, a shell, you know, and it's empty in the middle. The particles from the EPT process are more uniform in shape. So it reduces the amount of waste fines or waste powder that's actually produced. The other thing is that instead of being just an empty eggshell, internally they're like a sponge. So even if they break, they retain the flavor inside them in all these small sections. And we had a, a government organization do the CSI row um, in, in Australia do some GCMS or gas chromatography studies. Um, and they put them back to back. So the, the top one is the concentrate and aroma going into the system. And the bottom one is the actual powder itself. And you can see it's almost like a mirror image, which means hardly any flavor has been lost in that drying stage. And that's where a lot of the flavor is lost if you're making a powder. So we're pretty excited about that um, at the moment. You know, the, the French company is pretty excited about it as well. Um, and there has been a couple of installations in France. And, and it can be used not just for coffee or, or tea, but for many other products where you, you want to retain the flavor in that final powder. So that's you know, some of the latest technologies coming out. So getting back to, to FlavorTech and the integrated extraction system, or IES, it really allows you to produce, on the same system, many different products. Uh, in America, which is you know, we tend to see as the uh, ready-to-drink beverage mecca at the moment, 
They produce, we have customers that are producing one day tea products, the next day coffee products on the same line. The next day they might do berries or you know, fruit flavors and make concentrates. You know, they just you know, use it for many different products. It's a very flexible system, it's continuous, and it can be used for many different things. So the IES can be used for cold brew products, it can be used for ready to drink beverages, it can be used for instant or soluble products. Um, and basically, it's got a small footprint, it's continuous, easy to use, um, and it allows tea or coffee companies to actually become beverage companies, you know, so they can grow their markets. Um, that's it from me, I don't know if I've gone over time or under time. I'm open for questions. Um, if you want to send an email with questions or want more information, um, go to our website, flavortech.com. Um, it is, our website is in Chinese, it's in Spanish and uh, English. It's not in Hindi, sorry, <laughs> sorry. But um, it is in three languages, but it does have the various applications, it does explain the technologies. Um, and if you have any questions, you can always e email me directly or come and see us up at the stand. Uh, we're here today and tomorrow as well. So, thank you very much. And if you have any questions, I'll beat you to it. Any questions? I'm open to any questions. Favorite foods, favorite color, anything to do with the technical stuff. I'm open to, to anything. No questions? Okay, I'll, I'll start asking questions. This is the exam time of, uh, no, I'm not kidding. I won't do that to you. So no questions? No? Well? Friends, please feel free enough to raise your questions. Raise your hand if you have any questions. I'll pass on the mic to you. No? Okay. So oh, there's a question at the there's back. There's a question. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. So, uh, regarding flavoring in tea, uh, Miss, uh, is this uh, possible to uh, give oil-based uh, flavoring, or uh, should we give the extracts of the uh, flavors we want to add into tea? All, all the extractions are aqueous extractions, so we're only using water to, to remove that flavor. So those flavor compounds are coming out of our spinning cone column in a water mixture yes. um, and being collected through a condenser into a clear liquid. Um, if you come up to the, the stand, you, you, we can actually show you what it looks like. It, it just looks like water, so when you add it back to other products, it, it's, it's a neutral flavor. Is that your question, or are you saying add flavor to no, dry how, tea? No, how, how should we add flavor? Means, uh, what, is this, uh, what is the process of adding flavor to tea? Uh, uh, Means, we are, uh, we are extracting tea uh, yeah. out of tea leaves or uh, ready tea? Out of, out of tea leaves. So we're extracting the flavor out of tea leaves. Uh, yes. So how to add those tea, uh, tea flavors to tea? Miss, Why are you taking the tea flavors out of tea to add them back in? Sorry, I'm, I'm, missing, I'm missing the point. Like we are having a lot of herbal uh, variants, yep. uh, like uh, basil tea. Basil tea is there. Okay. And we want to add this with uh, CTC and okay. orthodox tea. Okay. So how do we uh, um, process this? Well, in that particular case, you could, you could possibly take the, the aroma out um, and then spray it on the tea leaves themselves or atomize it on, on the actual tea leaves. And I think we, we, ha we do have somebody that actually does that. Um, the other way to, to add it, if you're making tea powders, you can actually um, get some maltodextrin and add the aroma into maltodextrin and then combine that in your powder. Uh, we do actually have some tea aroma that's in maltodextrin upstairs as well. And, and when you smell it, you, you can't smell it, but as soon as you put it in your mouth and, you know, just a, a little bit, the tea flavor just explodes in your mouth. So come upstairs. Our application specialist, Shanavas, is up there and he'll be able to tell you more about what you can do in that respect. But you can get, you know, you can get basil flavor. Um, we do know the spinning cone columns being used for basil. It's being used for essential oils. Um, so you can capture them and put them into, sp spray them onto tea products, yeah. Okay. So that's possible. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So we have one more question. Oh, on. no, you can have more than one. Come on. You know, now that the floodgates have opened, you know, I'm ready. Yeah, my name is Ram Mohan. I work for a company called Iris Magnetics. It's an American company. We manufacture the magnetic separators, and we supply it to the industries, especially process industries, 
including food, pharma and all that. Uh -huh. My question to you is, you explained about, uh, you have supplied your systems to uh, Indian companies. So, uh, can I know which are those companies which have been using your technology? You're, you're asking a sales question there. You're, you're, you're <laughs> because asking, as you a consumer, sell... I'm also more curious to know about your technology you, to try it out. <laughs> yeah, you want to sell more of your separators to, to our existing customers. <laughs> yeah. um, we work with Alpha Laval, so just so you know from a technical point, we work with Alpha Laval. We're an integrator in Alpha Laval. So in Australia, we make all their electrical cabinets and etc. So we have this relationship. So we normally install yeah. Alpha Laval separators and, okay. and clarifiers. Yeah. So uh, so sorry, but um, <laughs> sorry, um, but um, we do have customers here, coffee customers in India, and you know companies like Dabo that, that use our technology. Okay. Um, uh, CCL. Yeah, let's skip it. There's a large coffee company, CCL, and you know customers in Sri Lanka. But I'm not going to tell you any more than that. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. Thank you. You're, you're fishing. You're fishing. Yeah. Thank you. So one more question. One more question. Okay. Yeah. Hi, sir. I'm Ayush, and I'm actually starting my own business for tea and coffee. Uh, one question from consumer point of view. So when uh, a consumer approaches us and we we provide them flavored tea. Uh, usually the sellers say it is organic or it is 100% natural yep. and suppose you take a basil flavor from a tea and then you infuse in CTC in spray format, uh, is it actually 100% natural or are there any chemicals or uh, artificial flavors added to it or is it just a pure extraction going to the CTC? It's a, it's a pure extraction, we only use water and, and steam um, okay. and it's clean steam so we actually use uh, RO RO steam to, to actually so capture like those aromas. So all the aromas are, are natural and, and that's part of our tagline. So flavor tech naturally is... So is like one. if we uh, have this whole setup with us and suppose if you offer 15 flavors to the consumer and if they ask us that the complete process and the flavors are natural, we can claim it, right? Yep. That is, and do you have any reports or something that we can... Uh, do you have any tie-up with an institute which can give us reports to certify that these are natural flavors? Uh, no, we don't, we don't have any re reports to because we're not adding anything else. It's just the tea and the water going through the system to capture that, that tea aroma. So if you're using organic tea, you don't even have to actually say that you're adding the tea aroma back because it's, it's from the original products, yeah? Okay, uh, just one last thought. Sure. Uh, there are a few uh, suppliers in the industry who uh, take actual whole orthodox leaves, whole leaves of tea and blend them with a original flavor tea like rose leaves or something yes these are uh, you can see the different flavors in the blend itself from your yeah. eyes and in this case we don't see them uh, do you have any idea if the final output will be very different in terms of taste uh, like well you can play around with the taste because flavor has a, a large part to play with taste so it's not just what you smell it's actually the, the mouth the mouth feel that actually changes as well so when you're processing we have customers in Indonesia and in China for example that do jasmine tea uh, where they get jasmine, blend it with tea leaves, and then process that through the system. Now they can decide, you know, and jasmine goes off very, very quickly. So for them, it's a matter of capturing the good jasmine aroma, um, you know, even though the jasmine may be a, a few days old, um, and just making sure that that's the only part of the aroma that is actually captured in there. So whether you add, you know, it, perhaps apple pieces or you know, other fruit pieces, you can add it to the tea or you can capture them separately and then blend it if you're making a consumer product just before bottling. So okay. that way, it's probably easier if you're doing fruit flavors, capture the, the fresh fruit flavor, determine what you want, capture the tea flavor, and then do flavor combinations on the bench top to see what's preferable to consumers. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, anyone else uh, who wish to put forth a question? Shall we conclude this session? You said you said right. that was the last one. Come on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Am I getting this? There's any more? Yeah. Okay. So with this, sir, we conclude the first session. Thank you very much for your precious time. Okay. Uh, we have a small momento. Thank you, everybody, for listening and, and the questions, gentlemen, and the fishing. Yeah, and the fishing. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. Oh. So please come on this uh, center at this stage. Uh, we invite Ms. Akanksha Kapadia uh, to present the memento to the guest speaker. Thank you uh, for
Thank you everyone for your presence here today. Uh, we conclude session one and session two will be at 2 p.m. Uh, till then we have a, sh a short lunch break. Please do uh, refresh yourself and be back at this place at 2 p.m. We will be having Mr. Rajiv Jain, Managing Director, the Sharp Trade and Deviers Private Limited. He'll be speaking on topics stagnant tea prices in bulk tea. We have an updated conference schedule placed outside the conference area. Do have a look. Thank you.